Hello everybody, today we will be looking at the principle of the domicile in the context of law. So, context of law, as I mentioned earlier, mainly focuses on situations or disputes or cases where there's an international element. And in such cases, which law to be applied is a really good question to ask. And in order to do so, we have to study various factors, such as the domicile jurisdiction applicable, any choice of law applicable, and all of that. So we'll be taking the first steps towards that, as we will be looking into the principle of domicile. So, domicile refers to a permanent home and a link between a person and a place. So, in more basic terms, it means the status a person has by being a lawful resident of a particular jurisdiction. The law of, per the law of a person's domicile is called lex domicile, and the burden of proof is on the person who asserts it. Once a person's domicile has been asserted, or in other words clarified, it can be used as a connecting factor to identify the lex causa. Lex causa basically means jurisdiction and the laws applicable to a particular case. So I'm going to keep this video as brief and as simple as possible in order to avoid further confusion. So types of domicile, there are mainly three types of domicile to be considered. And each of the domicile has different characteristics and therefore is very important to be remembered. So the three types of domicile are the first one being domicile of dependence, the second being the domicile of choice, and the third being the domicile of origin. It should be remembered that no one can have more than one domicile. However, there are certain exceptions to that rule at present and we will be looking at them as we move along. So let's go to the very first type of domicile, domicile of dependence. So domicile of dependence basically applies to children as well as married women. The situation where a person obtains a domicile because he is a dependent on another person. So that's why it only applies to married women and children. So let's look into the domicile of a married woman. A married woman's domicile changes according to their husband's domicile. The husband's domicile applies irrespective of her intention, whether she lives with him or not, whether that she is separated or divorced. It was clearly stated out in the case of Lord Advocate versus Jeffrey, which was a British case, where it was clearly said that a married woman does not have the ability to choose their own domicile. Moving on to domicile of children, as we know, children are known as dependents and they depend heavily on their parents. So, we should also remember that children have different stages. There can be orphans, there can be illegitimate children. So, which domicile applies in certain situations? We'll look at that right now. So, a child's domicile is mainly determined by the validity of his or her parents' marriage. A legitimate, a legitimate child receives the father's domicile. And an illegitimate child receives the mother's domicile. This is mainly because the father is unknown of a illegitimate child. And this was seen in the Dulip Singh case, which was held in India, where a woman received the ability to use the law of domicile on herself because she did not know her father. So, it is, but however, there are situations where a person's father's domicile cannot be applied. Another situation is if the father abdicates the child or legally removes himself from all connections to a specific child as seen in the Hope vs. Hope case. Now, talking about if we look at orphans, orphans are people who don't have both parents due to divorce, due to abandonment, due to their deaths or any other reason. So in such a situation, which domicile applies to orphans? So, according to the Domicile and Matrimonial Proceedings Act, which plays a vital role in determining the domicile of a person, the domicile of a child will remain the same as at the time of her parents' death. That's in a situation parents have died. However, it should be remember, remembered that orphans' domicile does not change based on their guardian. It can only change in a situation where they are adopted. If a child is adopted, he will receive the domicile of the adoptive father. And that is the only situation where a guardian's domicile will be applicable to a child. <coughs> Moving on. 
So our next type of domicile is domicile of choice. So very simply and very obviously, domicile of choice basically means a domicile acquired by a person based on his choice. However, there are certain restrictions to who can select a domicile of choice. This person should be above 16 years of age, can be a valid and married person, and he should not be insane. So, when selecting a domicile of choice, there are two main requirements that should be satisfied no matter what. The person who intends to acquire domicile should take up residence in the new place. A person simply can't state that I want to live in this place but not actually live there. And the second requirement being to acquire a new place with the intention of remaining there permanently. Domicile is something that requires permanent links to be maintained. So, for example, a person who is on rent somewhere, who takes up an annex or an apartment on rent, but does not plan to stay there longer or permanently, then that will not be the person's permanent domicile. And this is one of the reasons why on our identity cards we have the place of our birth and not the place where we currently live. <coughs> so moving on, a really important part of domicile is residence. Residence plays a huge role in the choice of domicile. A residence acquired with the intention to settle is sufficient. It's not necessary to establish residence at length and there are different cases which have different opinions with regard to this principle where residence was not required to have a specific length. So in Bell versus Kennedy, a British case yet again, it states to acquire a domicile of choice, the clear intention to reside there is essential. And if we come across the very first exemption for the fact that one person can only have one domicile. In Plummer versus IRC case, a person holding two domiciles in two different countries at the same time is possible, but the intention and sufficient links must be maintained. Therefore, it is quite clear that a person can have more than one domicile if the relevant links and the intention are present. So when we talk about residence, one thing that might come to mind is what about legal immigrants? What happens to them? So legal immigrants, as soon as they set foot on the country which they want to reside in, they will be selected, they will be applied as a domicile of choice, even though they have a house or residence or not. However, this does not apply to illegal immigrants. Therefore, that division, division must be maintained. So, intention. As you might have already presumed, intention plays a major role in domicile as well. So, people change residencies for four main intentions according to law. To live for a definite period and leave, until a definite purpose is achieved, to reside for an indefinite period, or an intention to reside forever. So, with all these four intentions, the required intention to maintain one's domicile is the intention to reside forever. This was held in the AG versus Roe case, which led this trademark, which the benchmark required for a person to establish his domicile. In the Winans versus AG case, it was held that long residence is not sufficient to obtain domicile. Just because a person lives in a place for 10 years does not mean he will be domiciled. His intention to be there permanently is a requirement. And this was seen in many cases like AG vs. Pottinger, IRC vs. Bullock, Reverse Case, and all of those cases. So it's quite important that you guys refer to at least two of those cases, as I mentioned earlier. So the intention needs to be proved. Because intention is something that may differ and requires a lot of proof. There can be two methods of proving such intentions the direct proof, where a person's statement can be used. But then again, it must be backed up with supportive evidence because a person's evidence can be given due to self-serving reasons. However, indirect proof can also be used. Here, what we talk about when we talk about indirect proof, what we mainly focus on is the fact that the courts will consider the circumstances of the person's life and will then decide 
what his intention is. So these two, in, these two methods are used to prove the intention of the party in question. A person can abandon his or her domicile of choice by ceasing to reside there and by ceasing the intention to reside there permanently. So any person can abandon their domicile of choice. They just have to make sure that they sh show the intention that they do not want to live there anymore and that they, they want to move to somewhere else. This was seen in the goods rational case, which was a very important case with regard to conflicts of laws. So let's talk about some extraordinary situations when it comes to domicile. So there are certain, certain people where a domicile cannot be applied to specifically. And in those situations, what domicile do we take into consideration? So first off, let's start with prisoners. So prisoners who are imprisoned will mainly have the domicile they have before they were arrested. However, if they are sentenced to a life sentence, sentenced to life, they will have the domicile of the prison. So refugee next set of people will be the refugees. Refugees who intend to return to their homelands retain their domicile. However, if they do not have the intention of returning to their homeland, they will be able to apply to receive a new domicile. This was seen in the Relord Evans case, where it was argued that refugees should be sent back to the place of their homeland or motherland. So another set of people who have extraordinary situations are soldiers and diplomats. So a number of factors depend on this, such as it depend on uh, the circumstances of their posting, the period of duty, the length of the posting, all of that comes into play when determining the domicile of a soldier, diplomat or foreign official. Mentally unstable and unfit people are the last extraordinary situation and extraordinary people who will be talking about. They will return the last domicile they held before they got sick according to their medical records. So that all concludes the domicile of choice and we talked about basically what's required to obtain domicile of choice, who can obtain such a domicile of choice, the requirements needed and as well as extraordinary situations with regard to certain, certain classes of people that require special attention. So we've already done two types of domicile and we'll move on to the third now, which is the domicile of origin. Every single person has a domicile of origin. This is the domicile we, each and every one of us, are born into. In a situation, let's say, a person does not have a domicile of choice, a domicile of dependence. In such a situation, domicile of origin will be revived. And this was held important in Udin was Udin case. Domicile of origin can't be abandoned. How, but, however, the only exception is if a person acquires a domicile of choice. The type of domicile of origin is difficult to discard, but can be done so by establishing a seizing of the law of residence and the intention to reside there and move to a new place. Thus, the domicile of choice is the only method the domicile of origin can be lost. And this was held in the Johnson vs. Johnson case, which was held in Britain. The domicile of origin, however, though it looks like the most obvious principle of domicile which can be applied for, to, in order to decide which law is applicable to a specific person, is not used as the connecting factor to de determine the jurisdiction and the legal system a person falls under. This is mainly due to some criticisms brought forward with regard to the domicile of origin. So, the very first criticism being difficult to tell where a person is domiciled. Just because a person is born in a specific place, medical records can be tempered. It can be recorded in a different area. And in such a situation, how do you really prove this person was born in that specific place? It's expensive to, the second criticism being it's expensive to prove the domicile of origin of a person. Especially someone who's been moving around and living across the continents. And finally, it's really easy for anyone to provide a fake domicile of origin with no real links. So due to these difficulties, the domicile of origin is not mainly used in order to identify which laws are applied to a person. Now, we talked about the domicile of a person. 
Let's talk about the Masala of cooperation. As you know, corporations may also have disputes with international elements. So domicile of cooperation basically means the place where the company has been incorporated. So this basically means a per the company can't change its domicile, even though it changes its business locations. This does not only apply to companies, it might apply to uh, government institutions, dep uh, departments, all of those as well. Therefore, even though the business location changes, that does not mean the domicile of the company can be changed. Domicile of origin and children. So, as we talked about it earlier, children mainly fall under dependence, domicile of dependence. However, in 1985, the Law Commission working paper was brought forward in order to specify the rules which should be applied to children and in order to prevent any inequality or treatment of children due to favoration of judges and lawyers. So according to that working paper in 1985, if the claimant is above the age of 16 and lives with both parents, then such child gets the mother's domicile. However, if the claimant lives with one parent, then he gets that parent's domicile. And in worst case scenarios, if the child does not live with either parent, then he gets a domicile of the country with the closest connection. So in such a situation, the domicile of origin will be used for people whose domicile can't be obtained due to domicile of dependence. So in simple terms, if the child's parents' domicile can't be determined, the country the child was found in is considered the domicile of origin. So it's quite easy to understand the situation and why some and why there are different types of domiciles, such as domicile of choice, domicile of dependence, and domicile of origin. Because if one fails, something the other type can be applied. And if that type can't be applied, another can be brought into play. play. So this is why there are different types of domiciles, so that people so that the courts can identify which domicile is applicable to each and every person. However, not all countries use the legal concept of domicile. Some countries use different other methods. This was seen in Cruz with a student case, where it was decided that even habitual residence and nationality can be used instead of the principle of domicile in determining which jurisdiction and which laws are applicable on a specific person. So habitual residence is basically a concept based on regular physical presence. This focuses on the physical presence of a person in a specific place or residence, as well as a time period, a specific length is required in order to establish habitual residence. However, the same intentions that, required, that are required for domicile are not required for habitual residence. Habitual residence can even continue if a person has been absent in a particular place for a very long time. Therefore, this is one of the this is one of the mostly used laws instead of the law of domicile. And finally, we have nationality, which focuses on the nationality, the country which a person was born in. Nationality is mainly a political concept which has rights and duties varying from country to country. Nationality is a legal relationship between a person and a state, and according to the principle of nationality, the state has the jurisdiction over any person born within that state. So some countries even use nationality rather than domicile, especially at the present times. So those are the two other methods used instead of domicile to deal with the conflicts of law. So. In this brief video, we went through what the principle of domicile was, the types of domicile, why it's important, exceptional situations where domicile, dual domicile can be used, and then we went into alternatives which can be used instead of the principle of domicile. So yeah, just a quick wrap up was wrap up about the principle of domicile is basically that it's one of the most important principles required and it will be used throughout learning this subject. So that's about it for today's video. Hope all of you guys are staying safe, staying indoors. 
and hopefully college will start soon because I'm getting pretty bored right here. So have a great day, all the best.